I think in, uh, in my uh, elaboration on your question, first question, I have covered the, uh, some of the ground which uh, is, would be in response to this question. But to reiterate again, RAND policy paper 2019 is a seminal document, I repeat the word seminal document, on all the multiple strategies, multiple strategies, both military, political, economic warfare and financial warfare or warfare against the financial institutions of Russia. To overextend it means to draw it away in several directions, distract in several directions and, uh, and, to, and to cause it the most severe damage, basically to attack its very, very existence as a state, as a Russian people who have a right to exist, the largest territorial entity in the world and people who have long suffered for two centuries, three centuries, they have suffered so many invasions including the nine nation and Tante which intervened in uh, after 1917 revolution. So this is a multiple strategy, it is not an ordinary strategy, it, is, it was actually it has already been in execution, only the, it has been moved from first gear to the fourth gear now, that is the top gear now. So, what was it? Why was this such a See, when all these strategists and think tanks in the world uh, plan for all this, they plan it against the background and the background was that the Western banking system, the Western financial system since 2008 as a well-known date and even otherwise earlier, has been going into a deepening crisis. It has not come out. It has not come out, though the printed dollar allows it to <laughs> allows it to become the greatest debtor in this in the world. But they can print, and people are generally generally reconciled to that. So far, they have been. Saudi Arabia was a very big backer of this because it's Saudi Arabia's ruler who agreed to the petrol dollar in 1973. That is the origin of it. But gradually, all the Gulf states also agreed to the petrol dollar, and everybody agreed to the world's reserve currency. No which is a completely unfair system because these people can keep on taking debts, live off the world, import everything and not pay for it because the value of the dollar will go down. Nothing can stop the value of the dollar from going down. So there is a deepening crisis. The, the, not the pandemic but actually the way the system worked because it became uncompetitive with respect to China. All consumer goods and all even machinery goods, even advanced technology goods, even patents in the world were now with China and all this talk of that, that they will stop the technology, they will stop the chips and it's all for public consumption. It's something like that. He's stopping all the applications with China and that will hurt China and China will put, be put in its place. But the main thing was this competition that the United States is actually out competed by China on almost all manufacturing and all design, even the high tech area is now gradually being taken over by the US. And once that happened, Europe is already in decline. Germany, which is regarded the greatest, uh, I mean the finest precision machine making country in the world. All, all the famous names in China, famous firms, they are in the shadow. Even in automobile, even in aircraft, even in computers, even in, in every, any field of activity, they were being outsmarted and outcompeted. So, the number of people who are unemployed. After 250 years of democracy and capitalism in the world, 50% of the people in the United States, work, working people in the United States, don't have economic security. They live from paycheck to paycheck. They live on the, in the tent cities of San Francisco. If this is what capitalism has given the United States in over 250 years, what about our friends here who think that capitalism, privatization, inequalities will deliver India's millions and we have got 1400 million, not, not the 200 million that there are, 250 million that there are in Europe or US. It's a completely absurd, ridiculous argument. It won't. And our constitution doesn't say it, but that's a side. So, you have a very, very deep crisis of stagnancy, overcapacity, 
over prediction against the capacity. No way to export because they, have, they are losing markets. As you know, China and ASEAN have already come into RCEP, Regional, uh, regional uh, Cooperation Economic Agreement. And the latest is that ASEAN is now dealing with China on a exchange of ruble with the local currency, something which India is now likely to step in the oil area. So the area of markets, capture of markets is decreasing and it is Asia and China in particular which have made the American economy not able to compete in the world, not able to compete in export, not able to compete in technology, not able to compete all round. So there is a very deep crisis and the aristocracy, the oligarchs who rule the world, US actually there is a it's an oligarchy, it's an autocracy. Same thing in Europe, in spite of the coverings of democracy. Basically, essentially it is lesser and lesser number of people who are determining the future prospects of more and more people in their own country. So there is a level of dissatisfaction with the systems. And in order to camouflage that. And what they thought, because the neocons and the European far right wing is, is, is always has this idea that we are superior, we, 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 were, we were superior, we are superior and we will be superior and we can take care of these new kids on the block. They have not been honest to themselves, at least publicly, except for few. There are few. There are a number of people in the West, number of uh, very good people, I would say who understand their relative position with respect to China and with respect to Russia. So thought they thought they will separate China and Russia. That is not working. That is not likely to work as far as my understanding is concerned. So they have come up to actually put into effect this and this has been going on for years. But if people should think that this is provoked by Russia, it's wrong. It is this strategy of containing Russia by over extending it in several areas and by uh, imbalancing Russia because they think they can deal with Russia through sanctions. Lots of newspaper articles have come out, lots of very great strategists and thinkers and analysts have said that Russia will be affected. But my humble submission is that they have taken care of it, they have prepared for it and they will not allow, in fact Russia will grow stronger out of these sanctions as it went with the first set of sanctions a couple of years ago. They will come out. They have already come out. People like Glaziev, <coughs> Sergei Glaziev, have talked about this five years ago. And they will accelerate their movement for self-reliance or let's say make in India, I mean make in Rus, actually make in Rus is a, is a very advanced uh, technology area. But they will not be, there will be hardships. but. <laughs> Let me state that the Russian people are strong enough, patriotic enough, have enough resilience in spite of this hardship of 20 to 30 percent increase in prices and roughly 20 to 30 percent people living below the desired standards. It is true, but they will suffer because for them, their country, <coughs> despite certain of this, Cosmetic process, protests in Moscow or Leningrad or Petrograd or, or Petersburg are being even headlined here in our newspapers and amongst our thinking of who should know better that they are great protests, peace protests. Of course, there should be peace protests. There will be peace protests. Why not? Young people want peace, but young people also want they also understand what is happening to their country, how they have been successively targeted and continue to be targeted. That's it. President Putin's statement of 24th February where he quotes his directions and directive to the Russian military, Russian defense ministry, is that our objective is first of all, to save or intervene in the situation in Donbass, that is Eastern Ukraine, save lives and make sure that we, since we have recognized these two republics, Luhansk and Donetsk, and they are, we have recognized them independent and 
they have invited us to, to come to their aid. We are going on invitation, we are not going on ourselves. That is the usual diplomatic stuff to intervene there and bring this. Secondly, are two bigger objectives that is to demilitarize Ukraine. Now, what he means by that is immediately, immediately that Ukrainian military assets, air bases, uh, logistics depots, ammunition depots, missile structures, uh, air defense radars, that will be neutralized and that they have been doing very successfully. In fact, I can give you, but you know yourself, the Ministry of Defense, Russia gives a daily briefing every day by a major general and he has outlined in what they call objects. Everything is object for them, factory is object, air base is object, so many thousand objects have been neutralized. Contrary to all kinds of fake reports that we gave that some Ukrainian aircraft uh, shot down some other Russian aircraft, much superior aircraft, etc., and helicopters, all that is completely fake and has been true fake by. But well, there are photographs of exercises, of photographs of, uh, I mean, videos of uh, older years or uh, simulated fights which are being shown around. So that they have largely succeeded in that. Thirdly, that they will denazify. Now, this is political military. It is neither military completely nor political. But it is political military. It is a combination. What is denazification? The common sense, common knowledge, but more, much more information, documented information, what you call it hard intelligence, is there with the Russian, or is it with the Kremlin or with the Russian Defense Ministry, on what has gone on. Because from 2014, the Nazis or the Yazo battalions or uh, organizations, semi-armed, some thugs, some mercenaries, some uh, plain, uh, plain military trained people who have been trained in the U.S. have been drawn into the state apparatus. They become part of the National Guard. It has been demonstrated. It has been demonstrated over eight years in, in Donetsk and uh, Luhansk. It's not that this is some theoretical calculation. They have been, the president of the state, that the president of Ukraine has actually presided, has actually presided over functions of these Azov battalion and they have been upgraded to Azov regiment and so on and so forth. So there is no, nothing hanky and there is nothing secret, it is out in the open. Out in the open the gradual integration of the openly Nazi outfits broadly referred to as Azov regiments or battalion into the state military apparatus. In fact, there are estimates that 80 percent of the higher echelons, including the cabinet of the Ukraine, are comprised of people who have affiliations with this kind of thing. 80 percent. Secondly, in the classical manner in which infiltration and subversion is done of any state, any state, it had been done even of Soviet Union earlier in those closing years and I was a witness to that and uh, some of my friends are a witness to that. Uh, that is how the state is subverted. When the institutions of the state are subverted, here the military institution, the political institution, the security institutions of Ukraine have been subverted by these elements. But this is, a, this is the most challenging, I would say the military objectives are you can say almost achieved because if you see the latest map as of today, I got the latest map or chart of the Ministry of Defense Russia, which is in public, it's in the public domain. That all their initial objectives, military objectives, have been achieved. There's, they are not going into Kiev for obvious reasons. That similar reason that we did not go into Lahore in 1965 or 71, because you don't want to get mixed up into street fighting. Military is not, not ideal institution to fight a street battle or street, uh, you know, shooting. So they are staying outside. They, this is the first, uh, actually many commentators have commented that this is very strange phenomena, not having studied the Russian or Soviet military literature, that the Russians are not marching into places like the capital, but they are, st from the fifth round of negotiations, I think, which is on today, that they have been 
negotiating, re marching, I mean going ahead militarily, in, and on particularly in North Bas, places like Mario Pol, etc. But this is a strategy which, which every day while the fight is, some fighting is going on, has been going on, and uh, military assets are being destroyed by either by missiles or by drones or by aircraft, uh, etc. They are negotiating. Now they know, they understand the character of this government in Ukraine. They know that they are working for time. They are waiting, hoping that something will happen, hoping that uh, the U.S. will intervene. Some NATO country will intervene, but they are not going to intervene. They want, don't want to burn their hands. They don't want to burn their fingers. They just use this as a catch for. And secondly, to bring pressure, military pressure and civilian negotiations. Because morale is a very important factor in life. These very people who are negotiating comprise of different kind of peoples. Some are hard, solid, what you call Ukrainian patriots, the others are not. And the hard, strong, patriotic or you could call it Ukrainian elements in the negotiating team are also human beings. They also realize what is the what is the factual position they are going back. Now they are on video. They are online conference. They are not even coming to Belarus. So they know the what is the balance, what is the what is what is ahead? What is ahead in 24 hours, 48 hours, 30, how long can this go on? How long can this go on that you entirely the entire country is being neutralized or is being weakened? or does not have logistics, or does not have petrol and diesel, or does not have ammunition, or does not have other, does not have communications. And its citizens are leaving. According to some estimates, three to five million Ukrainians have left, civilians, have left through the western corridors, apart from the eastern corridors. So they know where the, they know what lies ahead. And there comes a time, this is, but the strategy is completely different. In other wars, the negotiations have always been at the end. Even in the Vietnam War, negotiations were right at the end. In any war, negotiations or negotiations of, uh, of what are the term, is it complete surrender, is it partial surrender, is it signing of agreements, signing of treaties, all that is different. But here it is, both are going side by side, which is very uh, novel for the West, but for any student of Soviet or Russian history, it is a normal, normal strategy which they have adopted. So the political strategy, which I said, I have no hesitation in admitting that denazification is a very difficult challenge, a very, it's a formidable challenge. Because, I mean, you even if you take Kiev, which is the capital of the state, I mean, with the best intelligence in the world, with many Ukrainians who are actually Russians and Ukrainians are no different, they are brothers, they are the same people. Even then, it would be very difficult for them to weed out, neutralize, replace with genuine Ukrainians who love their country, who love their people. It's not an easy process. That is the one which is going to take a little more time, a little more determination, a little more, uh, uh, more intelligent, uh, more and more and more intelligent way of uh, denazifying. So that is the military and political. And politically, of course, the one single objective is politically that they will sign on the dotted line that they will never join the NATO. It will be a very good legal document and ratified to be ratified by the Security Council and other world organizations, but that they will never join it. That they will not permit on their territory hostile acts of intent or actual, uh, actual uh, acts of intent like pre-positioning bases pre-position military uh, bases or, or, the, uh, or the basing of military facilities, if I may say, or bases which, will, which can harm their neighbors, namely Russia, Belarus, etc. So that is the political duty. I think also, also a message would go to Poland, it will go to Romania, it will go to East Europe, it will go to Hungary. Because apart from these objectives, there is an unstated objective in my view, in my humble view, as a person who studied or has been a watcher of, the, of this country, of this union of states, Russia and Soviet Union, that 
this is a turning point in the dollar hegemony of the world. This is a tectonic shift in the balance of forces in the world. This is a tectonic shift to demonstrate to the world and I think the message has gone to many countries like United Arab Republic, Qatar, Saudi Arabia think they would never touch Russia, hardly ever touch. But now they are almost declining to talk to the Biden administration and to Biden himself. And that's a very strong message. Other countries are watching, they are not fools. They may have voted for the UN General Assembly's uh, vote, but they know in hearts of hearts and they have said so. That that is a one vote which didn't have a, a sort of a effect of, of the de facto situation, but they're watching. Uh, this is a turning point in the in the whole scenario of, of the of the balance of forces in the world, the correlation of forces in the world, and therefore that is that is really the political objective, in my view, the unstated one, but which in fact becomes the kind of it is it becomes the inevitable inevitability to this whole affair by Ukraine, a puppet government in Ukraine, a government which is uh, which is run on the advice and consent of the U.S. and 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 NATO at best is being dissolved. What happens? To individuals in that government, I don't think is that important, because it is the character of the government which will happen, which, which should happen, which must happen by by this by this particular uh, specific military operation which have been launched on 24th February. And they are not even a month. There's still seven eight days to go for the month to happen. I think any sense, any person or any administration with a modicum of common sense and a modicum of realization of the hard realities on the ground and the modicum and, 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 and the realization of the balance of forces, the fact that its friends and masters or masters and friends uh, provoked it to pick up this at this point of time. Maybe it could have been picked earlier, maybe it could have been picked a little later, but at this point to have accepted the assurances that they will come to their aid means hard aid troops and military hardware actually come to Ukraine's help and also to uh, also any other type of help, economic help, other help, logistics help, it has not materialized. Nothing of the sort except token, token kind of help and lots of talk and lots of shabash. वो कहते हैं अपनी हिंदी में चलो हाँ आगे बढ़ो हम तुम्हारे साथ हैं the election kind of slogan which is held so हम तुम्हारे साथ हैं वो तो पता लग गया कि कौन सा किसके साथ है तो ये position है I don't think we should pay too much attention to the names of the head of the state so he is the head of state now of course he is and the Russians have said but he is not even you know he is the President Putin has agreed that we will talk face to face, but but there can't be a talk of tea and uh, coffee. There has to be substantive agenda, which is an agreed agenda, which has got a, some kind of uh, meeting point. That has not happened, but it is like something will happen either this way, as I said, in, the, in a kind of Zelensky-Putin meeting or outside the Zelensky meeting through the negotiating people, depending on whether he appoints a plenipotentiary who will negotiate seriously and come to terms of, but there is no question and I will repeat it, the Russians have no intention of interfering with the sovereignty of uh, Ukraine, no intention, no intention of occupying uh, Ukraine for any moment longer than it is necessary, I am talking in days and weeks not months and years as has been the scene elsewhere in the world and that they have, they want to in fact make every possible uh, attempt and use to, shall we say, uh, solidify and regenerate and resurrect uh, the brotherly relations between the Ukrainian people 
and the Russian people because they have so many relations on both sides. They have the same language, they have the same church, the Russian Orthodox church to go to church for. I mean, many people do go to church. And uh, years and years and years, thousands of years of, hundreds of years of, of living together, working together, marrying with each other, speaking the same language. These are very strong bonds. They cannot be, they should not be replaced by some kind of a foreign ideology, which is, uh, after all, the fascist ideology is not Ukraine's ideology. 99%, 95% of the people there are people who have had experience of both Tsarist uh, Russia as well as Socialist uh, Soviet Union and now a modern nation state Russia which is, which is free of all the hang-ups of uh, revisionism, of uh, regressive ideas or backward ideas. It itself is a, is a developing democracy, very keen to make up with the West, very keen to live with its partners as President Putin keeps on saying, but it has no ambitions of any other kind uh, except to say that please just be a good neighbor. Just be a good neighbor. Is that asking for too much? With people, not from these people who are in, in the regime, but the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia are very, um, something tells me spiritually and materially, both. Both wanting to live as good neighbors, as, good, as, 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 as brothers like they were in the past. Uh, this is not an easy question, but I think India so far has taken uh, in accordance with the traditional approach that it follows the UN Charter, that it is for avoidance of any military conflict with anybody. We, by and large, have stuck to that line. Though others may think that in Bangladesh, etc., we did not follow that line. <coughs> Sorry. It has been uh, seeking a dialogue through diplomatic channels, through level, uh, high contact, diplomatic negotiations at every level, which has been now being followed, more or less. So India's position, of course, is that while Russia has been a very close friend and traditional friend, Russia means Soviet Union and Russia, so it's, uh, Ukraine was a part. Ukraine had supplied us many items of interest, both military and non-military, to the Indian, Indian, uh, to the Indian government, to the Indian state, to India. So therefore, we have no basic interest, and uh, India sees the point of view of Russia that you cannot have this kind of activity being permitted, which is a grave security threat to the existence of the Russian state. It is not a question of uh, some minor trouble being caused. It's a very existence of Russia as a state was at stake because of the unfortunate activities which are permitted or actions which are permitted by Ukraine's government that they will, they will see, they will seek a sense after all, they are, they are sensible people and uh, that we will do whatever is required, whatever we can do uh, diplomatically to exercise our influence in favor of negotiations, in favor of completion of the early negotiation, the avoidance of civilian casualties. Our own students are involved and that story is another story. It is not the story which has been presented by the Indian media. It is actually Russian facilitation which has got many of these people back, particularly through the eastern corridors. And, uh, and uh, that we will continue to have after this good economic, trade, diplomatic relations, cultural relations with Ukraine, with uh, the already existing good relations and economic and other relations, defense relations with Russia which are there. We, we actually, it's very, for us, it is, if you ask us, people like us who have been to both countries and may, may have known both, both people, we don't see the difference. We see that both are potentially, both are potentially very good and strong friends of India. That's the way, I, I, the rest of the detail is who said what is not important. These, these very binding, uh, shall I say, these very bonds are so strong, so visible, so proved over the last hundred years and more, 
uh, that uh, I think any government in Delhi would be would would pursue this line, which has been our traditional line in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of External Affairs, and so on and so forth. So, I only I am very optimistic that with all its ups and downs, this process will finally lead to good, happy, neighbourly relations in accordance with the United Nations Charter and as old friends. No, I think abstain is a, was a very, um, a very, very, very measured, very balanced step because there was no need to vote with the resolution. And there was no need to vote against the resolution either, because once the veto has been exercised, uh, the votes become redundant to that extent. It is only symbolic. It is only conveying a message that we do not stand with that the truth is only on one side, that the facts are only on one side, that there is a there is a there is a certain amount of uh, uh, genuine. Uh, uh, certain amount of uh, uh, position which has been taken, which is, which has justification, because you cannot permit, you cannot permit the basing of weapons of mass destruction, biological and chemical weapons. This is a fact which we have taken earlier, and that you cannot uh, permit a one-sided genocidal, quasi-genocidal, if you like, murder and killings of. Uh, of a particular community like the Russian speaking people. So Russian people speak is, people uh, speaking people are within Ukraine itself to go on like this in a murderous manner that they uh, that is gone on. Uh, it is a, it is a, I would say on the balance, on the balance it is a very, very sensible position that India took in that vote. Oh, this is, I know, <laughs> the Cold War is already going on. The Cold War to a certain extent, depending on how you define it, is already in progress because the one is the side which was the hegemonic size for 100 years, more, actually more, 100 years, roughly 100 years, where the dollar reigned supreme. The other side is the side which has worked hard, its people have worked hard, they have studied hard, they have uh, organized themselves in a, in a scientific way, both in China and Russia, against, uh, I should not be unfair, but against the side which has lived off its past, both its colonial ex surpluses in Latin America, Asia and Africa, and the capitalist enterprise that is spawned. But they became more and more monopoly capitalism. They, more, they became more and more exclusive they did not include their own uh, own population, their own people, who are, if one may say, if, if one can judge, so it's not, it's not for us outsiders to judge other people, but that they have been driven, they are being driven into unemployment, they are being driven into penury, they are, their social security are all but lost, and uh, and, and there is. There, uh, 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 there, is, uh, there is not a genuine democracy and as if one can quote President Putin in this case, there is an ornamental electoral system which passes, which tries to pass itself for a democracy or democracies. That's the change in the situation. That it's, uh, to a certain extent it is inevitable, to a certain extent it is ever inevitable in the rise and fall of nations or as some people like to rise and fall of empires or rise and fall of great powers since the time of uh, the great historians like Arnold Toynbee, etc. But the facts of life are that China is progressing by leaps and bounds into a modern fourth industrial revolution going on to the horizon of fifth industrial revolution and Russia in its play with all, with some of its inherited past, which we discussed for a while, a very, very sorry decade from 1990 to 2000 is also modernizing itself, though it has a further way to go, longer way to go as far as the welfare of its people are concerned, but they are the foremost concern of the 
administra- of the of the state administration in Russia. So the the Cold War is a, is a kind of a byproduct of this uh, fact of life. It is a it is a it is a terminology very uh, very much a favorite technology uh, the terminology of the diplomats, of all the paper tiger paper of the all the analysts and people who pretend to be experts to be writing articles after articles after articles. We have it we have in our own newspapers these kinds of people who will continue to talk about Cold War without actually without actually uh, really in fact I would say that in America there are and in Europe there are people who are realists on the score that they have evaluated uh, the uh, stability and the progress being made both in China and Russia and recognize this as a kind of a, a phenomena which should, the truth should be expected and not become Cold War warriors. There is no place for Cold War warriors now and they can shout and scream and make fake stories and plant articles and plant stories but they will get nowhere. This is my, this is my unfortunately minority view of, of what is happening.